It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery. Buck Bait. Better the Hunt. Rebel Six Rubs and Seasonings. Easy Cut. Limb Walker Game Calls. Hunter's Blend Coffee. Packer Max. Fourth Arrow Camera Arms. Scent Blocker. Scent Lock. Copper John. And Stanislavski Release Aids. Welcome back to another episode of the Up North Journal, everybody. I'm host Mike Adams sitting at Up North Journal Cabin North. Danny's in Cabin South. We're still social distancing. Next week, I hope to have him back in the cabin sitting next to me. That's the plan. So we'll see what happens. But uh, before we get started with everything, we want to make sure that everybody goes over and checks out Hunter's Blend Coffee. Huntersblendcoffee.com. Go over and check that out. If you're shopping, use the UNJ promo code. Save yourself 10% on your order when you check out. Uh, great supporters of ours, and, and we would appreciate it if you over there and support them as well. Uh, great Michigan company here. We wanted to get you over to buckbaits.com. If you use the Up North Journal promo code, you'll save 20% on your order. It's never too early to get over to buckbaits.com and start looking for some items that you'll use this upcoming deer season because it's just around the corner. I mean, it, it ain't going to be long. We'll be sitting in tree stands. But uh, another great Michigan company we want to mention that helps us out, Rebel 6 Rubs. Rebel 6 has some great rubs for, for fish, for, for wild game, for wild birds, anything you got that you get out in the field. Get some Rebel 6, put on it, and if you use North Journal promo code, you can save 20% on your order over there. And as we've talked with Slade a few weeks back, trips for trade. If you've got an opportunity and you want to trade a hunting trip for maybe a vacation or another hunting trip with somebody else, if you join their their little club here that they got and use the Up North 20 promo code, you can save 20% on your membership. It's a great way to get some, save some money, number one, but to maybe get an out west excursion or maybe even a baseball game that you want to go to and you can trade stuff back and forth uh, for some great things that uh, you just enjoy in the outdoors. So, all right. Danny, you uh, you about done over yeah, there? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready there. Uh, big shout out to Josh, Joshua Bilecki, longtime listener, and it's the first time he's watching. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in tonight. We got some uh, some good stuff we're going to talk about tonight. Absolutely. Ron Moses, be safe. You're trucking to Chicago. Take care, buddy. <laughs> no don't doubt. Take my, don't take our swag there. No doubt, man. That's, uh, you know, I don't even want to get into that tonight. What I do want to get into is we want to talk with our guests that we got on tonight. Go ahead, Danny. Uh, you, Introduce them. You know them. what? Uh, listeners of ours, uh, it's that time of year. They're out in the uh, up in the St. Clair River. Uh, they're going after walleye. So what better than to have a Yamaha Pro Walleye, uh, Robert Blosser, on the show to talk about walleye fishing? Hey, Robert. How's it going tonight? Hey, how you guys doing? I'm doing great. Hey, man. We're, we're here living the dream, man. Enjoying the outdoors. Awesome. You know, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world right now. But I went up north this weekend to get away from it all and enjoy it and be at the cabin. Danny was up at his cabin last week, so we're inviting you to our cabin so we can get rid of this madness and have a good time tonight. What do you think? Well, thanks for having me, guys. I mean, yep, a lot of turmoil going on these days, but the nice thing is is we still have woods and water to play in. So Absolutely, and that's what we want to talk about tonight. So you're with Yamaha. You, you do some pro walleye fishing. Uh, I'm as I talked to you before. I'm not much of a fisherman, but Danny he he does more of it than I do, and he's kind of uh, hip to the walleye stuff. So Danny, yeah, you go know, ahead. First question I got to have, you know, well, welcome to the cabin, and 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 Thank you. how does how did where did it all start? Uh, tell us a little bit about your background as to how you got into the 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 fishing scene itself to get yourself up to that level to say, hey, I'm going pro at this. So how, where did that all start? You know, obviously, it's it's not uh, something you go to school for. Uh, but myself, I grew up in a family of outdoorsmen, right? So been hunting, fishing, just being in the outdoors ever since I was little. Um, my passion for walleye fishing just kind of grew in my late teens. And, and it was more of a chess match to fish walleyes than it was for bass. And I'm not going to say it's easy to catch bass, but there's just something about walleyes that really make you think and really make you analyze every little detail to be successful. So fast forward a few more years, and uh, there was a, a regional championship held on my home body of water on Lake Wisconsin. And 
I had been active in the community and actively fishing that body of water for a few years. And uh, some of the competitors had hunted me down and said, hey, can you point us in the right directions? And um, I knew nothing about the tournament scene then. And I, I, at Free Will, gave them everything I had learned on the system. And uh, it happens, they went first and second place. Um, so that was kind of the light switch for me that said, you know what, maybe I can compete. So started dabbling, uh, dipping my toe with some local stuff and then some regional stuff. And that was 2004. Um, did really well. Um, moved on. And in 2007 was my first year fishing the national stage, actually fishing as a professional. Had an okay year, um, something to hang my hat on. And then 2008 was really my breakout year. Qualified for the championship. Took second in the championship, which back then paid eighty thousand wow. dollars, and that really jump started my career and gave me some bankroll because I didn't have supporting partners that I worked with back then. I was I was the young gun, new to the scene, never been heard of, and and that's what really paved my way. And thankfully, I've I've had a really good run at tournaments, had up and down years, but my up years have been really really good, and I've been fortunate enough to to uh, make some great partnerships along. The the way and help with product development and just get the support and the backing that you really need uh, to be competitive at this level. That's awesome. You know, that, that, that thing, when it started out when you were younger, you know, just around the, your, the round, you grew up in Wisconsin, I take it? Yep. Uh, Northern Illinois, uh, Wisconsin transplant since I've been like 14. So. Okay. All right. Quite a while. So, so you, you kind of did it around and then some but he asked you for your opinion, and then look at where you're going with that. And like you said, when you finally made it there, and you're in the pro, when you're in the pro division, people look up to you and, and look at you and say, "Hey, the guy knows his stuff. He's been doing it for a little while. He's he's, he's up in the tournaments." Uh, you know, when you get into a situation like that, uh, I know the tournaments this year are kind of all over the board. If they're going to happen, sure. if they're not going to happen, um, did you start to look at yourself and say, "I got to go fish"? The, the bodies of water that you want to, where the tournaments were going, or did you just go with the tournaments as they went? Um, you know, obviously the tournament sets their own schedule or sets the schedule. Um, so you're kind of, you have to fish those. But back then, you, you know, I, I fished every day. I was fortunate enough to live really close to the lake. Um, so what I did is when I started and, and took a butt kicking at a tournament, those were the learning experiences, not the ones you did well in, right? So I would take that back to my home lake and go out and practice a technique that maybe I wasn't accustomed to, that I just got schooled on. And whether I caught fish or not on my home lake with it, at least it allowed me to start to play with the presentation and understand the dynamics of it. So when I got to a place where that was a, a useful tactic, I already had 70% of the work done. You know, the other 30% was really fine tuning it on the bite itself. But that's what, I think that's what really furthered me along quicker was going out there and practicing something, knowing I might not even catch a fish, but in the long run, it was going to help me overall. Okay. I was just going to go down that when you said you're, you're practicing different techniques of catching walleye. Uh, you can you can uh, you can jig. You can uh, drag a worm on a harness. You can you can do a lot of things to to go after them. Sure. What's your like? What's your number one go to for you as a professional walleye angler to get those walleye? You know, that's a really hard question to ask because you can ask a bass fisherman and he's going to say, you know, like, uh, I like to flip or I like to pitch docks or, you know, I like to drop shot off deep structure. The thing with walleyes is you can't catch them the same way every day. A, a walleye changes by the hour and you've got to be willing to make the adjustments with them. Now, if the bite's really, really good, um, yeah, sure. You're, you're going to have a good solid week, week and a half of fishing, but you're definitely going to have windows. But to say a favorite, you know, I really enjoy trolling the Great Lakes for big fish. A lot of people are going to say, well, trolling's boring. You know, you're just putting out some offshore planer boards and you're setting a spread of lures in the water and you're driving around aimlessly. That couldn't be farther from the truth. There are so many intricate details that go into trolling, and it's all in your gear setup, right? Every rod has to be set up the same, even down to the exact feet of line on each reel. So when I set one rod back 100 feet and another rod back 100 feet according to the line counter, 
they better both exactly be the same. If one offs by five or six feet, which doesn't sound like a lot, some days makes the difference in getting bit or, or not. Um, and then one of the biggest things that, that people overlook is current. Walleyes obviously relate to current, but there is current in inland lakes, whether it's wind driven, whether it's driven by maybe underwater springs or feeder creeks. Lake Erie, Lake Huron, they have a ton of current. And you got to be willing and, and be able to read the current so you can position your baits correctly to the fish. Because the fish are used to their prey coming in a certain direction with the current or against the current. So a sideways with the current typically never wins. So being able to read all those fine details, even down to speed. I've seen where a tenth of a mile an hour makes all the difference in the world. So adding all those things together is is like one big giant puzzle, right? And when you put it together, it can be lights out. You know, if you in Wisconsin, we can fish three rods a piece. So if you've got a buddy with you in a boat, you can put six rods out and you can have times where all six rods have fish on them as long as you're dialed in perfectly. You know, you just said, you're talking about the setup. And that's, I've been on a charter one time. And the captain of the charter, that's the one thing he, he talked about was the speed had to be just right for the depth yep. you're running, the right lure. They all had to be the same. And I'm like, I said, well, there's a real science to this. I said, you really got to pay attention. He said, oh, yeah. Yes, you do. And that's what impressed me about the guys like you who, who do this is the how much work and detail goes into it. It's not just throwing and casting a lure. Sure. You know, it's uh, it's something special. So hats off to you guys that do that and can make it work because I'd have them all yeah. tangled up. <laughs> and, and, and I think you know, it's I, just I, the challenge, right? I, I like the challenge. I like the chest match. I like, I like trying to stay one step ahead of the fish. You know, a lot of people say, well, we caught them here yesterday, but we couldn't get them today. And the one main model when you're tournament fishing and you're practicing those few days before the tournament actually starts, it's not about where the fish are right then and there. It's about where are the fish going to be in a day from now, two days from now, three days from now, because they're not going to be in the same spot. And it's about putting all that stuff together of what you learn during the practice period to try to isolate where you think they're going to be come go time. Well, you know, I was just about to ask you about that, you know, because this day and age with all the electronics, you're talking about a uh, uh, half a mile an hour faster, slower, and, and using all your electronics and, and marking your, your points and where all these fish are at in your practice time. But when you get to, to, to game day and, and launch, um, you, you've probably been doing your homework as to knowing, kind of know where those fish are going to be in the next 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, and that's that's the fun part, right? So there's been tournaments where I thought I was on the right pattern or the emerging pattern, not the dying pattern, right? Um, and the wind does a complete 180 that from what the weatherman said it was going to do. And I've had to go fish stuff that I didn't even look at in practice, but the conditions were just right. And that just comes with experience and time on the water. And and even for guys that have their, their own body of water, my advice would be if you go out and typically fish the same areas, pay attention to what it's like the days you catch them versus the days you don't. Because the days you don't, something has changed. They're still biting. They have to eat, right? right. They're somewhere to be caught. So you, you can't be afraid to stray from the norm and go fish a windblown shoreline when maybe you've never even fished it before. Never, never been there. Um, but as long as it looks right and the conditions are right, Typically, it's going to fish right. That's interesting. Exactly. And then that's that's all about practicing and learning those other techniques that you might not uh, needed to do. Um, Correct. I tell you what, let's go to a break. And when we come back, let's talk about, uh, obviously, you need a boat to ride in and you need a motor to power that thing. So when we come back, we'll talk about that in our next segment. All right. We're going to step outside and we'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has reinvented the way you buy bows. From now on, you can make the most educated decision possible by basing your bow choice specifically on your shooting needs and goals. All you need to do is ask yourself, what kind of shooter am I? What do I want to achieve? PSE will help find the right category for you. So, what kind of shooter are you? Find out at psearchery.com. 
Welcome back. Second segment of the show. Sitting here talking with Robert Wasser from Wisconsin, talking about walleye fishing. And Danny wants to know about the gear to get on the water. So Danny, what do you got? Well, you know, you, you, I know, well, unless you're the man and can walk on water, <laughs> no. obviously you need a boat to get on water. <laughs> right. So, you know, obviously you've got a boat of choice. And what boat of, of choice do you prefer and ride in to get on the water? You know, so for the last six, this will be my seventh season now, um, consecutively, I've been running a Skeeter boat. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we went through a model change. And uh, again, for this year, I'll be running a WX2200, which is a 22-foot boat. It is a deep V, right? Um, it's it's more of a, a deeper cockpit style than your traditional bass boat. Obviously not as fast, but it's meant for big water, right? It's, it's meant to fish the Great Lakes comfortably and safely. Um, you know, in, in some of our tournaments, my longest run one way to date is 127 miles, 128 miles one way. Wow. And, and did that three days in a row. Um, so we're talking 250 miles a day for three days in a row. So you need good equipment to put it through the paces and, and get you where you need to be safely, uh, but also comfortably, right? I'm not getting any older or any younger. Um, I like to fish in comfort. Right. Absolutely. You know, you, you got to fish in comfort and obviously you got that powered with a, a Yamaha, correct? Ah, uh, absolutely. Yep. Um, so I run a 300 Yamaha offshore on the back of that. Um, and a lot of people say, well, why do you need such a big motor? Or oh, that thing must be a rocket ship. And honestly, it's about boat control, right? It's not about top end speed. My boat tops out at, you know, 56 to 58 miles an hour, depending on how it's propped and elevation and weather. Um, it's, it's not a speed demon. But where the power of that motor comes into play is when you're in that big water. You need to be able to safely navigate that vessel. And typically, when you're in big waves, you need the torque and thrust of that motor to power that boat up a wave. So you're in control of the boat. The wave's not in control of you. Um, so that's the biggest thing, right? And then I also run a 9.9 .9 kicker on there, and that's to do all my trolling applications. So if I put that 300 just in gear at idle, it's going to troll too fast for a walleye application. Salmon, sure. Musky, absolutely. Um, but when we start talking walleyes, we're, we're talking those speeds anywhere from one mile an hour to maybe two and a half miles an hour, three on the extreme end. Um, so I use that little T99 kicker for all my slow trolling applications. Um, power trim and tilt electric start really couldn't ask for a whole lot more. You know, you know, and with with the Yamaha motors, uh, maintenance on these things. I don't know if, if you're the technical type that gets your hands dirty and you do your own maintenance, or yeah. do you take them to your local marine there. No, um, both, right? So when I get my boat, the marina has to do the initial PDI, and that's where it's originally hooked up to a computer. Make sure all the correct mappings in there. They do the initial oil fill, the initial gear lube fill. So basically, the motors just come out of a crate. So they do all the initial setup, but from there on out, I do all my own lube changes, uh, whether it be oil or gear lube, until I hit some of those um, special periods, like your 100 hour is one that you want to take it back to the dealer, because again, they're going to plug that motor back in and make sure all the correct mapping is there for the software. Um, but in between, in those in between intervals, it's a piece of cake. I mean, if you can, it's easier than changing the oil on a car, uh, honestly. So if you can do <laughs> that, no problem with your outboard. You know what is amazing? You talk about the software. I mean, we, we expect it now on cars, but I mean, back when I was a kid, I mean, I could change oil in a car. My dad taught me how to work on a car. It's pretty easy, but they've gotten computers well, on these, but, but mean, now they're on boats. Like, like the motor I'm running has uh, a digital throttle, wow. right? So gone are the days of that cable. When you use your throttle, mm -hmm. you don't have that cable anymore driving that fuel valve to open. It's all fly-by-wire. So there's zero friction there. The power is instantaneous. There's no lag waiting for that fuel to be delivered. And you have one less thing to corrode and bind up. I don't know about you guys, but uh, in some of the older boats I've had, that cable starts to get bound up, and it's hard to put it in gear or put it in reverse, and things just break down over time. But with this new fly-by-wire, I mean, having the power there, exactly when you need it and having zero resistance is is awesome 
you know, the well, things well, that they're changing like that just simply amaze me. I mean, Danny, you work in the automotive industry. I mean, <laughs> you're familiar with this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. It's one of those things that the technology now today with what we're doing and where we're going from the uh, con- internal combustion engine all the way into battery power. And, and, sure. and looking at the Yamaha. And, and what dealer do you take yours to for the initial over there? Just so we can give them a shout out. Uh, uh, you there. know, so I've got a great local dealer about three miles from me. It's Don's Marine in Lodi. Um, that's where my boat comes to. Those guys are awesome. They're the ones that get my initial stuff up and running for me. And then I bring the boat back to my house and I actually rig all my own electronics. Um, you know, I do all my rod holders, seat bases, trolling motor, things of that nature. Anything that's electrical, um, that's going to be an addition. I usually do myself because I want to know exactly where that fuse holder is. I want to know exactly how the connections were made. So if I have an issue on the water, I can diagnose it quickly and, and not waste a lot of time trying to figure out what the problem is. Are, are the newer boats, the newer model boats, are they, are they pretty much set up for, for all this type of add-on equipment to make it easy enough for the average person to be able to do it? You know, even these manufacturers are making it easier now because a lot of these boats now are coming with standard equipment, including your fish finders already rigged for you, your GPSs, your kicker motors, your bow mounts. You know, a lot of the manufacturers are selling package boats now. Um, So it takes a lot of the guesswork out. Back in the days, you used to have to kind of piece your boat together uh, when you were buying something. And, And for the general consumer now to go out, they can buy the whole thing as a package, basically turnkey and be ready to hit the water. There you go. That's awesome. You yeah. know, uh, Linda and Ed Thorn- Thornhill said Skeeter Yamaha, and they did a 68-mile run on the Okeechobee tournament one way. That's, nice. That's, 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 that's very nice. Good so, you know, we, we talked about the Skeeter boats and, and the Yamaha motors. Um, if anybody wants to see these motors, uh, where can they go to find out more information about the Yamaha motor itself? Obviously, Yamaha-Motor.com. Um, you're going to have a ton of resources there. And actually, probably one of the one of the most useful things on their website you're going to find is a prop selector, right? Everybody has propping questions. And you may not know it. Maybe the dealership set your motor up with the wrong prop for how you want to run your boat. Maybe you're always going to have a family in there and you're never going to be by yourself. That's going to call for a different prop because you've got more weight in the boat. Uh, But Yamaha makes it easy. They've got a prop selector on there. You select your boat manufacturer, your model, your motor, and then give it a couple other pieces of information. And it's going to give you three or four recommendations and eliminate the other 500 that are out there for you and really make it easy. Going to let you hone right into where you need to be in that, that area. Yeah. Okay. That's something I never really thought about. We used to do a lot of water skiing and, you know, you had to have a certain prop for, for the ski boat. Sure. You know, and but, you wouldn't run the same prop if you were going out fishing on that boat, right? And not right. trying to pull a bunch of skiers. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes great sense. Um, you know, and talking about props, uh, obviously, uh, when you get a boat, and it, picking the right motor is key. How does somebody like me who doesn't know a lot about this, you know, you maybe you've got a 14-foot aluminum deep v uh fishing boat and you want to put a boat to you know to do it inland lakes or maybe you've got one to go on the great lakes how, do, how does a person even start to begin to figure out how to choose the right motor uh, hands down the first place to always start is your manufacturer horsepower rating plate on that boat um so that's going to give you the maximum amount of horsepower you're allowed to put on the transom of that boat what i will tell people is don't go less than 20% of whatever the max rating is because then we get back to having the needed power to safely navigate that vessel. So it can really be detrimental to underpower a boat. Hmm. Um, So you always want to stay close to that max rating. Obviously, it's there because that's the best performance for how that hull was built. But you never want to underpower a boat severely. The second thing it does is it absolutely kills resale. You're going to have a hard-pressed time. When it comes time to get a new boat or a bigger boat, getting rid of something that's really underpowered. So most people, obviously, if they're switching boats, they're not taking that same motor they had with, with their old boat and putting it on a new one, I wouldn't think. No, but what you do is you see people that get a boat, and the boat was so well built, it outlives the motor. It outlives the Johnson two-stroke from, you know, the mid-80s that, that has finally died on them. And they're looking to repower. Um, so when they're looking to repower, 
the biggest thing is, is make sure you're still within that maximum rating uh, on your vessel. Gotcha. Makes sense. Always got Absolutely. It. And there's one more, and there's one more thing that we want to talk about Yamaha um, is their, their power pay. Um, whether you're a pro, a semi-pro, even amateur anglers in your, your, you don't even have to be sponsored by Yamaha, but if you use the no, Yamaha they, motor, this thing is off the hook, right? Like they shocked the industry and made waves when they released this. Um, if you don't know what it is, basically what it is, is it is for tournament fishermen. It can be local, uh, regional, national, really doesn't matter. Any sanctioned tournament. So all you have to do is go to Yamaha, look at their website. You're going to see a power pay icon, open that up, and it's going to have all the details. But basically what it does is if you're a Yamaha motor owner within the years specified, you're going to get paid for fishing that tournament if you're the highest place Yamaha owner. You don't have to win. You don't even have to take third, fourth, fifth, sixth. You can take 50th, and as long as you're the only one that signed up for it and there aren't any other Yamaha owners that signed up for it ahead of you, you're going to get all the money. Um, so it's a great incentive, and, and it's basically getting a lot of outboard owners that have had Yamahas some cash back in their pocket. You gotta like that. that, that that's awesome. And you know, you gotta like that. There, there are programs like this out there, right? That other manufacturers do as incentives. But typically, you have to pay to get into the program, and that's how the program's funded. Yamaha, no entry fee. The money's coming out of their pocket, and they're putting it right back in the ears. So no pay to play. <laughs> no pay to play. Just go play. Go play. I like that. And get paid to play. <laughs> yes. That's good stuff right there. So there you go, guys and gals. He got one. Get in there and make sure. And you can go over to the, the Yamaha. Uh, what was the website again? The Yamaha. Uh, Yamaha-motor.com. And there's going to be uh, information on power play right there. There you go. So go over and, there and, and check it can, out. And, and the official website is YamahaPowerPay.com. There you go. For the overview. And you go there and you can go from there. I tell you what, Denny, we're uh, getting close here to our second break. So why don't we step outside real quick and take a second break. We'll come back. We'll continue the conversation. What do you think? I think so. All right. We'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now, the most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Welcome back. Third segment of the show. Uh, a little, some good talk here during the middle of uh, the break here. For those of you on the podcast that they are not watching, you got to get over. Check out the commercial breaks. That's where we have a lot of fun talking back and forth. So Absolutely. You know, and, and one of the things when we talk back and forth, uh, I got a question for my brother. Uh, here you are. Uh, where did, where did, I, I had the question. Now it just disappeared. There you, go. <laughs> you need there some you go. new glasses, man. No, it, it, it scrolls <laughs> on me. Um, so you're going to go to a new lake new river to fish how do you approach it um great question right like one that comes up all the time start with the internet you you can find out so much information nowadays on the internet second call the local fishery biologist they are a wealth of information and nine times out of ten they're gonna put you on a bite right away so if you're coming in from out of out of town whatever it's a, a weekend vacation a week-long vacation Look at the internet, but call that fisheries biologist, and he's going to say, hey, this part of the lake is where 85% of the fish are residing right now, and you can probably catch them this way. Um, may not be the biggest fish or the smallest fish, but he's going to give you a good jump start. Uh, second thing I'll do, or third thing I'll do, is, is obviously look at the time of the year. Are we spring, fall, summer? What are the fish doing? Are they migrating for a spawn? Are they uh, getting ready to eat a lot to go through winter? Um, is it the middle of summer, the, the uh, doldrums of summer where it's super hot and these fish are only active early and late? 
Um, so uh, time of year is, is going to come into play heavily as well. And then once you kind of get some of that down, then you can start fine tuning. Uh, is it a shallow body of water? I'm going to look for large expansive flats that might have bug hatches going on. Is it a deep body of water? I'm going to look for some pretty sharp drop-offs uh, along shorelines if there's any bluffs or things of that nature um, where those fish can actually use that as a barrier and push the bait fish into the, that rock bluff so they can't go anywhere to be able to feed. Um, Great Lakes, I'm going to probably look offshore. I'm going to look for structure out um off ashore reefs, whether they're man-made or natural, uh, any islands, and, and then start to fish with the wind. Um, I want to be on the wind-blown side most of the time. I want wind coming in to whatever I'm fishing, whether it's a shoreline or an offshore piece of structure. If I'm fishing an offshore piece of structure, I'm always going to fish the wind-blown side first because typically that's where your active fish will be. There you oh, go. That's awesome. Comment from Linda and Ed Thornhill. They're at Lake Erie now for the spring bite. So obviously it's springtime. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Erie's on fire right now, right? So Erie's one of those magical places where you can catch fish on anything. And I'm sure you can catch one on a hot dog. I can attest and actually say I've caught one on a gummy worm before. Um, but <laughs> Erie is fun, right? So Erie falls into one of those places where today's electronics really shine. So when I'm out at Lake Erie or any great lake for that matter, I'm looking for offshore suspended fish that are following the bait. And they're just making their seasonal migration from the west end of Lake Erie to the east end until they turn around and come back to go up the rivers to spawn. Uh, but with the electronics nowadays, I won't even start fishing until I mark fish. And I'll drive around 20 to 25 miles an hour, and I can still mark fish that fast on the electronics. It's a real small, small little blip, right? But once you have confidence in what kind of blip you're looking for, um, you can cover a lot of water really fast. So at 25 miles an hour, I might drive around for two hours, cover 50 miles of water, figure out exactly where the school is, the leading edge, the tailing edge, and how wide it is, and now I can get right in there and just demolish them. That's awesome. Well, you know we got to ask. can destroy. I want, I want to hear the gummy worm story. <laughs> uh, we, we were fishing crawler harnesses, right? We were, we were uh, slow trolling crawler harnesses, um, spinner blade on the front, some colored beads, and, and a night crawler. Um, the fishing was stupid good. You know, <laughs> unbelievable. World-class fishing. And that's when the hot dog reference came up <laughs> first time in my boat. We said, you know, I bet you we could catch one on a hot dog. And I happen to have some gummy bears in my glove box, and I, or gummy worms in my glove box. I said, you know what? Let's try this. <laughs> so we actually put one on a spinner, put it on a bottom bouncer, sent it down, and I bet it wasn't seven, eight minutes, and we caught a fish on it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is. That is. That, that's awesome. Uh, well, another question we got for you from Nate Friel. What is the best river strategy? What kind of structure in the river are you looking for? If any types of current water levels, et cetera, et cetera. What are you looking for? Okay, so rivers rivers are a double-edged sword. Rivers are some of the easiest things to fish. They're also some of the hardest things to fish. Um, and, and I say that because rivers are ever-changing. The easiest thing about a river is walleyes are always going to relate to the current, and they will hardly ever suspend so typically you can eliminate all of the water column except the bottom two feet. And now what we're looking for is current breaks. We're looking for current deflections, whether it's a wing dam, whether it's the tip of an island, whether it's a big lay down, um, whatever it may be, we're looking for something that is deflecting current because those walleyes will sit just inside the fast current. And basically they're opportunistic feeders, right? They're, they're gonna feed um, whenever they're given an opportunity to do so. Even if they don't want to eat, they can't pass up a T-bone steak sitting right in front of them, not being taken away. Um, so they'll sit in that slack current and they'll let the bait be washed to them by the, by the current. So they don't really uh, exert any energy. They don't have to spend time looking. They just kind of sit there and wait. So it's a matter of identifying the current breaks on the body of river you're fishing 
um, that hold fish because they all won't. And once you find a couple that hold fish, identify what's unique about those and try to find other places that replicate that. But you're always, always going to fish the current. So it sounds to me okay. like they're sitting at a buffet table that's made actually like a conveyor belt. They're just yeah, it's for like it to come one by. of those sushi conveyor belts, right? It just yeah. keeps coming <laughs> past you, and when you see something you want, you grab it. Nice. See, I can relate to that. <laughs> there you go. See? Fishing in buffets. What yeah. do you want? You know, but I I just learned something. I mean, we, we fish the Saginaw River. I, I have ice fished the river before for walleye, and it, it got very frustrated. You know, the guys I was with, I don't know anything about it. It's like, okay, send your lure to the bottom and crank it up about a foot and a half off the bottom and sit and wait and jig. Sure. It, you know, and I don't know. To me, it was just, I never got a bite. That's- it was boring. That's a patience game, right? You're waiting for the fish to come to you there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, when you're fishing your current breaks on rivers, the fish are there because they want to eat, and they're also resting. So they're they're kind of killing two birds with one stone. Okay. Now, a current break doesn't have to be a visual either, right? So if you've got a hole in the river, mm-hmm. uh, let's say it's 8 feet, and then it drops off to 12 and then comes back up to 8 or 6, that whip is a current break. Those walleyes can sit right behind that and they're out of the current as well so they can wash their food come over their head and come up and eat when they need to Um, which is another great point whether it's rivers or inland lakes great lakes walleyes always feed up if you look at the positioning of their eyes on their head they're meant to look in front and up walleyes will hardly ever feed down Um, so if you're going to err always err on the high side uh, because you can, in, in lakes, fish underneath the fish if they're suspended, and you won't get bit. They won't chase that bait down 95 times out of 100, but they will chase it up. And if you look at like a, a Lake Erie or a, um, a body of water that's that's got good visibility in the water, it's clear, you can have your bait, if you're marking fish at 30 feet down, you can have your bait 10 feet above them. And that's not much at all. So if you you look at 10 feet, that's the height of a basketball rim. How long do you think it takes a walleye to swim that far up? (laughs) Not very. It's like two flicks of the tail and he's right there. So if he sees something he wants to eat, they will come up for it. But if it's underneath him, he's never going to see it. That's interesting. Uh, Yeah, I didn't didn't know that. So Speaking of eating, another question from from Todd. Uh, During the fish fly hatch, the bite always seems to slow down. Do you get any tips or tricks? during the fish fly hatch that you would suggest? Yeah, so um, your typical bug hatches are gonna happen on soft bottom, right? What I'll do is is either slow way down and, and go like 0.5 miles an hour and basically try to force feed a fish that is full. The other thing is, is you can go the other extreme and go super, super fast and try to get a reaction bite. Now, those are two things to try when you have to compete with the hatch. So with the electronics now, you actually see the hatches on your graph. You see your whole screen kind of fuzzy in the middle there. That's typically a bug hatch. But usually the most productive thing is is to find harder bottom. Go to the rock or go find clay. Um, You're going to have less of a hatch on those types of bottoms. and you're not going to have to compete with the natural food as much as you would on that soft bottom. There you go. Try it. Slow it down. Force feed a fish. I've never heard it put that way before. Me neither. <laughs> Open your mouth Jump and bite. The, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. Uh, I tell you what, we're, we're getting kind of close here to our last break. Why don't we go ahead and take that, and we'll save the rest of the time for the show. And uh, we'll come back, and we'll run through our, our usual couple of questions we've got for people and uh, pass along any other questions that you may have here in the next break. So we're going to step outside. We'll be right back after this. Acceleration is part of PSE's DNA. PSE pioneered the speed movement. Now they've developed the vapor category to help you find the most powerful bows on the market to fit you. High speed equates to intense power and building the momentum you need to be successful. Are you a vapor shooter? Find out at pscarchery.com.
Here we go. Stand by in three, two, and one. Welcome back. Last segment of the show, what we refer to as the fun segment. like to have a little fun here and loosen up a little bit. We've talked a lot about fishing. we talked a lot about gear, about how to get the right motor, how to get the right prop for your Yamaha, all kinds of good stuff. And now we want to know a little more about Robert here. So, Danny, I'm going to let you have it and you, kick it you off. You know, the, the first thing we talked about earlier when we were on the phone with him is he's just not you're a professional walleye guy no he actually goes out and does some whitetail hunting as well right you know uh so you you obviously you, you better hunt when you're in wisconsin that's all i got to say about that um you nice. hunt wisconsin whitetail you you go out west uh give us a little background into the hunting side of, of robert you know i love fishing right um but I don't like ice fishing. There's there's something about <laughs> only being able to fish through an eight inch hole when you've got all this water around you. Um, I, I do a few trips a year, but that's just not really my gig. I'll fish a river that's still open in the middle of winter. Um, but when it starts to get cold and we start to get ice, I start to hunt. Right, I I love chasing whitetails, uh, especially archery season. Um, and, and muzzleloader season, right? I like it down dirty and cold when them deer are up on their feet and they have to eat. And it, there's some magical times that happen in the dead of winter when, when it's hard to stay out there. Uh, but that's been some of the most exciting times for me. And the other thing is, is through fishing, I've met some tremendous people. And I met one of my best friends probably 12 years ago, and he's from Colorado. And for the last eight or nine years, uh, he's been showing me the ropes out there. I get out there almost every year, and we chase some elk through the mountains and some mule deer. Um, right now, I'm still acquiring points for my sheep and my mountain goat and anxiously awaiting the day I finally draw one of them. Uh, but, yeah, I, I love to get in the woods, man, and, and I, I love to be out there. Archery That's does it awesome. for you. It's archery. Right? Archery does. Okay. Archery does. I, I really like uh, the up close and personal. And on the flip side, right, like uh, I do a lot of long range shooting too, not necessarily while I'm hunting, um, but just to hone skill. And, and that's a whole different realm is that thousand yard shooting. Um, you know, there's that's a whole nother game and a whole nother puzzle that has a lot of satisfaction when you put it together too. You know, when, you, when you're shooting long distance like that, I got to admit, you're ringing steel. We're shooting steel or we're shooting paper. Okay. All right. Man, thousand. Put that into perspective. Thou, see, a thousand yards, that's 3,000 feet. That's like two thirds of a mile, roughly. Yeah. Yeah. It's out there. It's out there. I, I mean, we got a hundred yard football field. Uh, that's 300 feet. So you've got three plus football fields. Man, that's a. That, oh, okay. Thou, yeah, that's right. It'd be a thousand. A it, thousand it, yards. Be, yeah, I got gotcha. you. That's, that's a long way. That's a long way, man. That's something yeah, that, that's a game I've always wanted to play, but I've never had the opportunity to, to take it up and, and you know, yeah. shoot that distance. And we, we talked to you earlier today and you said that you've got uh, a 15, uh, 1500 yard range to shoot at. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I actually am from Point Out, Wisconsin, which is just north of Madison. And our neighboring town, Lodi, uh, has a gun club called Winnequa Gun Club. And it's uh, one of the longest ranges in the Midwest. They hold all kind of national matches there, whether it be pistol or high power. Uh, but they have a 1,500-yard outdoor range there, uh, electronic scoring. So you actually get like an iPad so you don't have to drive down to the target <laughs> to see where you hit, right? It's a long uh, walk. <laughs> so uh, they make it really nice on you, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, it, it truly is trying to guess wind, and it, it's almost like chasing fish, right? Like, There's... if I throw this here, what is the current going to do to my jig? Is it going to sweep my jig in front of the fish's face just right, or is it going to sweep behind the fish? Shooting at 1,000 yards, is the wind here three miles an hour, or is it seven down there, and what is that going to do to my bullet? Right? How do I get my bullet to go right where I want it? Absolutely. Speaking, speaking of bullet, uh, Nate Frio wants to know what caliber you're rocking. Uh, you know, uh, I like a lot of calibers, right? Um, I'm either shooting when I'm out west. I'm usually shooting a 300 rum uh, or a 28 Nosler. Uh, a lot of my long-range stuff, I've got a 6.5 Creedmoor chassis gun uh, that I like to pump the rounds through so I don't necessarily, you know, run 500 rounds through a, a hunting rifle barrel and, and start to degrade the life of that barrel because when I do take the shot on the animal, I need to know it's going to land right where I want it to. Um, so I don't want to start harming or disgrading a barrel and having it end a life sooner. Mm -hmm. So I run one gun at the range um, that I can just keep replacing barrels on. 
Gotcha. Okay. Well, when you're in the field uh, out west, I mean, we hear people taking long shots out there as well. Uh, what's what's the longest uh, distance you've taken an animal at? Uh, just over 700 yards. That's a good Jeez. poke. That's a good yep. poke. Nice. But that, you know, that was one of those situations where everything was perfect. Sure. Um, the animals had no idea we were there. The wind was nothing. Like one of the first times I've ever been above tree line and really not had wind, right? Usually mm-hmm. it's blowing 40 up there. Um, and, and we just had time. I think we sat behind the spotting scope and, and got our setup ready. And we were behind the, the glass for probably 30, 35 minutes uh, before the shot was even taken. So there was there was no rush. You know, there was plenty of time to calm the nerve and get the heart rate right. And uh, it was just one of those things that worked out perfectly. Yeah, we, uh, we we played a little bit of long-distance shooting with the archery game. Uh, and actually, Danny and I were shooting the TAC, uh, Total Archery Challenge here in Michigan. Okay. Uh, coming up in the end of August. And, you know, we're shoot, nice. shooting anywhere from 40 yards to a little over 100 yards. And yep. I, I know at, at distance how it affects the arrow, you know, a wind. And it doesn't have to be a whole lot, you know, depending on what size arrow you're using. So uh, the bullet, the same way like you're talking. Now, when you're looking down range and you're spotting, for those long distance shots, are are you looking at tree movement? Are you looking at blades of grass movement, leaf movement? What what's the one thing you try to key on to make that call? You know, when you're at the range, obviously there's range flags, right? And mm-hmm. and they're placed at specific yardages, and you can read the range flag and say, okay, when it blows like that, it's a seven mile or a ten mile an hour. Um, but when you get up into into a hunting scenario, um, typically you're looking at mirage. And, mm. and we could talk about this for hours, right? right. Um, I would say just Google it. Uh, but what you're looking for is the waviness of the mirage. And the direction that mirage is orientated will tell you an estimated wind speed at that animal. Okay. All right. Learn something new here again tonight. That's nice. I know the one thing we looked at on the mountain, we were actually shooting up up the mountain, you know, about sure. they had some 100, 120, 130 yard targets at the practice range. You'd watch the flags. And it was amazing the difference in the flag, you know, speed or the ripple from where we were sure. standing versus uphill. I mean, it changed. It was, it was just very eye opening. It's the first time I'd really paid any attention to anything like that, you know, with archery you know, equipment. And- As you guys know, you know, if you have got extreme angle shots uphill, downhill, that's not your, your yardage you're going to shoot to is not your line of sight yardage. Right. Yeah. Compensation. Uh, Angle compensation. Yeah. You know, either way. So another question for you uh, from my brother, Terry, what's the largest walleye you've ever caught? Ah, you know, um, my biggest one to date that I believe actually came in a tournament on Lake Erie and was just over 13 pounds. Really? That's yeah, a... it was a great tournament fish. <laughs> That's, yeah, 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 right. You think? Well, when you go to weigh in, how many fish are you allowed to weigh in? Uh, usually five. Okay, so kind of like bass fishing then. It's five. Yep. And okay. then it depends on what body of water we're at. Can you call, right? Can you, uh, when I say call, like, can you take a smaller one out of your live well and replace it with the bigger one? Mm-hmm. Some places you can. Some places, once you put that fish in your live well, you're going to weigh that fish in. So when you catch one, you have to make the decision right then or there, do I keep it or do I throw it back? Um, wow. So there, there's a little bit of strategy that can come into play there, but... Erie is one of those places that you can call. Um, so typically, that's why you see giant weights out there. And I think that day I had five fish for, I don't know, it was like 48 or 50 pounds. Nice. Now, I assume that you've got somebody else in the boat with you to keep you honest, another fisherman that's not a partner yeah, fisherman? So- so we get uh, what's referred to as a co-angler, right? So you don't know who your partner's going to be the next day. Um, it's somebody you've never met typically, and and they're there as a co-angler. Um, so your total weight, you act as a team for the day, and your total weight combined is what each angler takes to the next day with them, and they'll go fish with a different pro, and I'll get a different co-angler the next or the upcoming days um so that's that's where the honesty comes in right you've got somebody you don't even know in the boat with you uh, and and that's where the checks and balances come in at gotcha okay oh that's cool one other question from todd uh do you run floaters with your beads to help you help keep your harness up he definitely likes eyes on his blades uh floaters all depends right so uh, if i'm pulling spinners and i'm targeting suspended fish 
no need, right? Um, I'm going to guess you're probably pulling a bottom bouncer or a windy rig or something of that nature. Yeah, then like a styrofoam bead or a couple uh, floater beads, sometimes that's great, right? Because what happens is if, if you can... If you can make your rig more buoyant than the weight of the blade and use a smaller blade, that rig will actually just kind of suspend off the bottom. It won't sink, it won't rise, but it will just suspend right there. And a lot of times that's that's a great action those neutral to negative fish are looking for. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. See, that's good information. That's why he's a professional. But that's not all. Now I get time for our questions. <laughs> because... I tell you what, you're a guy that's always on the road. Obviously, you, you've got hunting, you've got uh, whitetail, muleys, you're looking to go after sheep, you've got uh, walleye fishing. Uh, you've got to have a favorite go-to meal that you're going to cook for, for Mike and I at, at, at camp, and you're going to say, hey, guys, I'm going to cook you, what would it be? If we're at camp, I'm going to probably whip up some homemade chicken and dumplings. Oh, man just because it's going to stay with you in the woods and it's delicious and it's easy to make. You know, my dad used to make that at our camp. Um, he doesn't get it there quite enough anymore to, to have it on a regular basis. But I tell you what, when he, when I seen him start, you know, deboning chicken and yep. I'm like, Oh, I know what we're having tonight. I tell you what that is, that, that sticks with you. It fills you up. I like that. Yeah. That's, hey. you know, that's an old timers. Um, that was something I remember as a, as a little, little kid having at my grandma, uh, my grandma would make up a deer camp. It was either that, right, or biscuits and gravy for breakfast. Um, oh. So those those two things, right, like that's deer camp to me. That's that's out in the wild. There you go, some good sawmill gravy. Oh, man. You can't go wrong with biscuits and gravy. No, no. doubt about it. <laughs> um, all right, so you're traveling to these tournaments. You're, you're driving around. you got to have a favorite snack. Either, okay, so we'll, we'll add hunting in there, too. maybe in your backpack for hunting sure. or maybe out on the boat for your tournament. What, what's your go-to to have snack with you? Well, obviously, you know, I got gummy worms in the glove box <laughs> of the boat. Um, but, no, you, it's it's hard to beat a good jerky, right? Like, that is that is hunting food, and that is also boat food, right? It's something easy. It's something that fills you up. It's actually got some nutritional value to it, which I'm usually not known for. Um <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, when you can find a, a dynamite jerky, and jerky is something that not everybody likes the same thing, but when you find the, the one that really trips your trigger, like I'll, I'll stock up on that. I'll have that in every truck, every boat, everywhere I can have it, because when I want access to it, it's got to be close. Yeah, I, it's like I'll take five cases of that right now, put them in the truck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because you don't, like you said, you don't be, want to be without it. So, yep. right. Okay. Okay. So, so now, so now, the last one for me is going to be: so you're traveling in your truck, eating your jerky, pulling your boat, or going to your favorite hunt stand. You got to be listening to something, maybe on the radio or, or in your earbuds. What, what would they? What's Robert Blosser listening to? You know, I uh, I graduated high school in '96, so I, I kind of lived through the the alternative rock grunge era, and and right now. I'm running Sirius XM in the truck and it's on lithium, right? I'm I'm still jamming those mid to late nineties tunes, early two thousands. We heard the same thing week before last. Remember that, Danny? Yep, yep, yep. From uh Randy Stoppenhagen out in Idaho. But probably about the same age, yeah. So I, I can sure. see that. Yeah. And he said the same thing. That's what he listened to on Sirius XM. So that is awesome. Nice. All right, Mike, your turn. Okay, so we're gonna step in the wayback machine. Um if you okay. had if you had a hunt to pick or a fishing trip to pick, or an outdoor excursion to pick, and you're going to tell Danny and I, it's like, man, you're not going to believe this. This this is the the story that, that sticks in my memory that I tell everybody, you know, for whatever reason. What is it? Um, probably the first elk I harvested, right? Uh, actually, it was, it was a two-week time frame. Um, went out to Colorado for the first time, elk hunt and archery, uh, never been out there, got off the plane in Denver and could see the mountain range and, and was just jacked, right? Um, got up to my buddy's house. He's up in the mountains, lives at 9,500 feet. Got out of the truck, tried to get my gear out, and I'm like, man, it's hard to breathe. And uh, by the time we got to 11,000 feet above tree line the next day, um, 
I understood the term flatlander, right? <laughs> that That's when reality slapped me in the face and said, you thought you might have trained for this, but you might as well just sat on the couch and ate potato chips the whole time mm-hmm. because what you did didn't help you one bit. Right. Um, but that was a great hunt. Pushed through it, right? Loved every minute of it. Uh, was fortunate enough to harvest a, a nice 5x5 five five that first year with my bow. Uh, life was great on top of the world. Came home, and about seven days later, I killed my biggest whitetail ever with the bow. And that was a 177 whitetail. Uh, it, it was two weeks that were just out of this world. Um from, from first experiences to, um, you know, personal best animals. It was just one of those things that that whole timeline will never leave my, my mind. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, magical moments, you know, magical first. Yeah. And, and when it starts tying together with other things within the same year or time frame, it's a, it's a magical time for sure. I understand that. Uh, you know, I, I want to throw one at you here that I, we haven't uh, shown this picture yet, and I've saved it. It's a picture of you and your daughter. Um, what would you suggest, uh, of getting kids involved in the outdoors, whether it be fishing or hunting? I mean, kind of, how would you explain it to somebody, you know, especially since you've got your daughter here in this photo? Um, you know, it's obviously something I've kept her engaged with because that's how I was brought up and she loves to, to fish. She's just starting to get into hunting, but there, there are enough programs out there to be found. And and the one I can think of right off the top of my head is the FAF, which is the Future Anglers Foundation. Mm-hmm. They actually host events, right? Um, they're free events. Kids get, I don't want to say prizes, but they, they get a, a fishing rod or, excuse me, or a tackle box with a little bit of tackle in there. And it that event is actually held where they use the equipment. Now, typically it's held at a small pond or, or something of that nature where they can actually fish. Sometimes it's in a gymnasium or something like that, but they'll actually get hands-on with the equipment. Show them how to tie a knot. Show them how to put a bobber on. Um, and it's great for the parents too, right? Maybe they have never fished before in their life, and this is something they're both going to learn together and go on this journey together. But I would definitely seek out some of those organizations like Future Angler Foundation because there's going to be some type of event close to your area at least once a summer, if not multiple times during the summer, that you can attend and, and just start to get your feet wet and learn about the equipment and learn about conservation and and right and wrong and and actually how to start targeting different species of fish. You know, that's that's awesome. I've never heard about uh, the Future Angler Foundation. That, this Tonight's the first time I've heard about that. And we're, sure, so, we're pretty connected with the outdoors. So, I mean, uh, is this something that's new or we just or have we missed the boat? Um, no, uh, you guys missed the boat. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's funded by the NPAA, um, or, or MPAA hosts some of the clinics okay. for the FAF. Uh, the MPA is the National Professional Anglers Association. Okay. Um, so they kind of work in conjunction with each other for product and, and uh, facilitation of the events. Uh, but the Future Anglers Foundation is doing great things. Um, you know, I know that some of our high schools in the area, we've got bass fishing teams. Uh, we're seeing an uptick in that. So is that kind of working hand in hand with some of that or no? Uh, A little bit, right? The, the FAF is, is, I don't want to say geared towards younger kids, right? Because it's, it's about anybody. We, we don't care if you're 40, 60, 80, or eight, um, if you want to learn about the sport and more about the outdoors, uh, they're all about it. And, and they're going to help you get to where you need to be and give you the resources to make it happen for you. Um, and, and that's not the only one out there, right? There's there's other ones out there. Uh, and it's as simple as just looking up your, your area and figuring out where the next event may be. But the high school stuff, man, um, just banging. You know, these high school fishing clubs and obviously the college fishing clubs and fishing teams, um, I don't want to, you know, the, the saying is, is like, get them off the couch, get them out of the video games, get them outside. Right. Uh, I right. get that. But this high school initiative is doing so much more than that. Right. It's, it's taking people who maybe would have played baseball or maybe would have played football, like playing sports, but it wasn't a true passion okay. while they're standing there at practice. They'd rather be out with dad, um, skipping a jig under a dock or, or jigging a minnow. Right. And now this gives them the opportunity to actually explore their passion with a purpose right gotcha 
you know, and it sounds like that foundation is something that uh, maybe a parent uh, who's not uh, an angler themselves could go with their child and they could both yeah. learn together hand in hand. Absolutely. No age requirements at all. That's and, awesome. And you know what? And you can go check it out at futureanglers.org. There you go, Danny. Check Thank you. Thanks for looking it up. Um, yeah, go over there and check them out. If it's uh, and if you know somebody, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's your nephew or your niece. Uh, could be you know any kid that's you know close to you that you know you want to reach out to them and help them out. Be a piece of information you could give them and get them started sure. in the right direction. So, um, Danny, you got anything else? Uh, I got all my questions. Okay. Well, more questions? well, before we leave, uh, once again, uh, you know, where can we find uh, the uh, the program for? Uh, a little bit of money from Yamaha, and also where can you find more information about Yamaha Motors? So Yamaha is going to be yamaha-motor.com. Uh, you can find PowerPay information there. Otherwise, you can go to directly to yamahapowerpay.com uh, to get the information there. There you go. I, I think we're going to need to check back with him during hunting season to see how that hunting side of it's going. Right. You got a trip planned this, this fall? Well, I can tell you right now, uh, the, the two apps I've gotten back, I was unsuccessful in both, and that was uh, Bighorn Sheep and Mountain Goat. So June 7th here coming up uh, is when Colorado will announce the rest of the draws, and that'll be uh, elk, mule deer, uh, pronghorn, uh, and a few others that I didn't apply for. All right. Well, good luck on that, and hopefully you, you score one of those tags. Thank you. You can get out that way. Well, I'll tell you what, if you hang with us here for just a few minutes, uh, we're going to wrap up the podcast portion of the show, folks. If you go over to our uh, social media sites, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you know, give us a like, give us a share. and uh, it, Subscribe know, to us at YouTube. Subscribe at YouTube on iTunes. Also, if you give us a review over there, that helps us out as well. So that'll do it for us this week. And, Danny, next week we give a quick shout-out real quick what we got oh, coming yeah. and what's going on with the gentleman we got coming. Next week, uh, I did a video drop about a week ago. I think it was before I went up north. Uh, next week, June 7th show, Jerry Milos, business owner of Easy Cut, uh, is going to be on to go over the Easy Cut family. We're going to talk about Easy Cut. And also, he's going to come up with a way. We're going to give away a sling pack. I have no idea what he's thinking about. So it'll be news to me and Mike as to how he plans to give it away. But we're planning to give away a, a sling pack that I estimated value, I think, is either 250 300 bucks. Yeah, it's. I'm telling you what, this thing is loaded. And if you're an outdoorsman, uh, you know, you don't have to be a hunter per se. I mean, if you like doing outside stuff, if maybe, you know, you, you're, you're just trying to improve some a wood lot or something like that. Uh, or cleaning up a wood lot. The, this sling pack, I'm telling you what, you've seen us talk about it. It's, it is a dynamite package that uh, you sh- want to be sure to get in on. But we don't know how we're going to be giving this away yet, and he's going to surprise us with that. Yeah, no idea. So stay tuned for that. That'll do it for us this week, folks. We'll be back again next week. You all take care. This episode was brought to you by PSC Archery, Buck Bait, Better the Hunt, Rebel 6 Rubs and Seasonings, Easy Cut, Limb Walker Game Call, Hunter's Blend Coffee, Packer Mac, Fourth Arrow Camera Arms, Scent Blocker, Scent Lock, Copper John, and Stanislavski Release Aids. Thanks for listening and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal.